a group of women from Leeds. Fighting poverty and shame. We want to show you that it's the everyday little things that affect people living in poverty. Things you may not have thought about before. We have come together to produce this film and tell our story through eight objects. If you don't have a secure home, it's a massive barrier to building a better life. Amina Jr. found herself illegally evicted by a private landlord two years ago. She was six months pregnant and studying at university. Being pregnant and homeless was really scary because I never pictured my life being like that. The first thing I wouldn't say when I met someone is, oh, I'm homeless, by the way, or I'm in temporary accommodation because you feel that they're going to just judge you straight away. Everyone assumes that if you're homeless, you're a drug addict or come up in a bad background and had to leave home for other reasons, but sometimes other people can make you homeless. I've been living here for over two years now, and a hostel is a temporary accommodation, but I feel like... It's not so temporary. I've been here a long time and it's getting a bit draining. If you see a house that you want to bid on, you have to add it to your basket. And then if you get the property, they phone you within a few weeks. I'm only bidding on housing associations and council houses because I don't have the trust in private landlords anymore. Over the course of a few weeks, I was going home and the landlord would come in and he'd take the microwave or he'd smashed the beds to pieces and he, turned, he ended up turning the gas and electric off so the property wasn't really safe for us to live in. I'd like to be close to my mum really and to my family so I've got my support network around me. Oh look, there's a house in this area. I think I'm going to bid. I was illegally evicted by a man with no remorse. How can I carry on with my passion for fashion when the past three years of my university work are gone? Anxiety, paranoia and depression are my new friends. Bedroom floors, sofas, dispersed hostels and bidding numbers. What a life for a little baby, put on the back burner by a stranger. I just bid on one of the houses here. I'm not sure which one it is, so I thought I'd come have a look at the area. And it's quite nice, it's child friendly. It'd mean everything to get my own place, especially for baby. Should have somewhere permanent to grow up. I won't have to worry about losing everything. Sarah had to give up work when she got cancer. She has been fighting it for seven years now and living on employment support allowance. She has no friends or family living nearby. Transport costs are on the increase annually. First bus in Leeds have just increased their fares again. It wasn't until I, I was going through my cancer treatment did I realise the poverty of not being able to go out and use the bus? Many a time I've actually stayed in because I can only afford the bus ticket or I can afford a coffee. It's hard to do both. Whereas before, it wasn't a problem because I was working. I've really pushed myself to the point that I have to get out at least once a week just to be able to have an outside, an outside world. Brilliant, thank you.
I've lived in the same house in Leeds for 31 years and I have seen lots of changes. In recent years I've noticed more and more people in my area not being able to afford to buy food. So seven years ago some friends and I started buying extras when we went shopping. People would turn up on my doorstep, hungry most days. We decided there wasn't much dignity in handing out tins, so we have set up a lunch club at our local church. Having to ask is a big effort for most people because they've got into situations and they find it so difficult to get out of and they find it very, very painful and traumatic. It's not easy to find the right resources quickly enough without you getting into a cycle of debt. People are not being able to afford food because of inflation, rent increases, wages not going up, zero hour contracts, sanctions. There's numerous things that are holding people back because the cost of living is so high. Places like this, you feel ashamed of coming in the first couple of times, but then because you start getting used to the people, it, it then becomes a little club that you can come to once a week and you can meet these new people, old people. The thing with volunteering for me is it helps with my self-worth, it helps me get out of my house and it gives you a sense of purpose that you're giving back to a community. There's some bread. We don't uh, do the queuing system, we do the restaurant system. It's a day out, we like to serve people, that's why we're here. There is a lot of stigma attached to poverty in this day and age. It's also about keeping your dignity. There's so many people that assume this is a chosen life and for so many people it's not chosen. I think them kiddies are still hungry. I think somebody's given her their dinner to finish off, she's so hungry. Oh dear. Right, a bit more. Today we've had some families in that have struggled through the holidays because trying to feed them three meals a day has proved too much. They can't possibly do it. So we're not getting nothing for about a week and a half. Oh. Yet again. Haven't they messed you about, Alicia? I'll sort you something out of. They've said that they've changed her claim over and she's to reapply. So she's been without tax credits and now she said they've stopped her family allowance because it's all to be done different. So she may be one of the ones that falls into the universal credit. Universal credit is a benefit that's been rolled out to replace the tax credits and the housing benefits. People are getting left now without benefits for six to eight weeks because of the changeover of the system. It's important for Alicia, she's had no money for a week. We've been given the small food parcels. She's had a hot meal today, so we've given her another small food parcel and then she'll come and see Father Darren and she'll get a food bank voucher and that'll enable her, hopefully, to feed the children over the weekend. Traditionally, the role of the parish priest is to walk around the streets and engage with people. Um, so to get involved with period poverty, it's, it's something that the parish priest wouldn't do. I've got my barber behind me who's collecting sandwich towels, tampax, tampons and such like. So it's great to actually bring them here and for the volunteers to actually distribute them to the wider community here across Green. 
It's not yeah. acceptable that people in this country are going without the bare essentials. People often come and see me afterwards for help with basics that most of us take for granted. Yeah, just come up here. Right, yeah, I don't. Mm -hmm. That's it. You're more than welcome. It's easier for people to identify and see the need without people having to ask. We try and look for that in our group and do that. And then if they don't have to ask, it's more like you've given them a gift. It isn't shameful. It's happening. It's happening so often in this day and age. And all we can do is try to bring some of the old values back of caring for each other. Christine raised three children single-handedly and is now retired. Her only form of income is a state pension. The British state pension is now ranked the worst in the developed world. She is a mum and a grandma and has fought to keep her family together all her life. This is your key and then it tells you how much you've got on. I've got £4.93 pence on at the moment. Sometimes I go on to the emergency payment, which is £5. You get charged, but at least you don't get a big bill coming in. So although you've got to have the money there and then, or you've got no electric, in some ways it's the lesser of two evils. I've got a cup of coffee today. Uh, but sometimes I have to make a decision whether I want my washer on. So if there's not enough electric, then I'd probably have a drink of juice. When the children were younger, I had my electric cut off um, for about eight months. And uh, they came while I was at school and everybody in the neighbourhood knew that that's what they were doing. It was through some winter months so it got dark really early we used to just go to bed i felt like i had to hide it from people you know people at school who didn't know the main reason that i didn't tell people is that i thought if the school teachers got to know they'd inform the social services that they'd take the kids away I wouldn't sit and talk to people and say that I can't afford this and I can't afford that. Sometimes I just can't afford to go and see my family and my grandchildren and I find that really difficult. Mariamma and Amina Junior come from a large family of seven children and 14 grandchildren. That's a lot of pairs of shoes to buy. The school clothing grant is part of the Education Act of 1980. It was brought in by the government to help families on low incomes. However, it's not compulsory, so many councils around the country do not offer it. Leeds stopped offering any kind of help over three years ago. The girls are now working together to find solutions for children in their own community. We grew up and we weren't really ashamed of it. We were used to it because it's something that we've always had to do, you know, hand-me-downs and even with shoes. But once you get into high school, people start taking note of that kind of thing. And, you know, we weren't bothered by it but then we became bothered by it because so many people were saying so many different things and it's, it's not fair that any child should have to go through that just because they're not as 
well, they're not as well off as everybody else. Every year in September, you have to have a new school bag. And if you don't, then they all know that you're poor and can't afford these things. And mm -hmm. it, it's quite hurtful the way the other kids act and speak about it. So. <laughs> are, you, are you all right? Yeah, not bad. Everybody else all right? <laughs> we had a pair of um, Versace trousers. They were from the charity shop. <laughs> but the point being is we were really proud of them. A lot of people, once they realised they were from the charity shop, were like, well, you've not actually gone out and bought that, so... You're still not on our level sort of thing. So you still you still get the stigma even if you've got the accessory. Go. We've decided to set up Education Aid off of our own experience with school uniform. It's a recycling scheme to recycle the lost property and also any donations off the parents. Our main aim is to make the re-gifted uniform feel like a gift to the child so they're not feeling the stigma off their friends about wearing second-hand clothing. So we'll be packing them in little brown bags and handing them out to everybody. Amina Senior is self-employed and works hard to support her household. But like many people, she has little left over at the end of the month. A lot of people in poverty don't, don't have savings. And this is one of the problems. Because when you don't have any money to live on, you can't actually save money. Some funerals that take place months after the death, because the family have to get that money together, which causes a load, load of stigma and embarrassment for people when they have to wait six months or more to bury their loved ones. A member of the family passed away recently and there were some issues um, about raising the money for the funeral. Last year I lost my partner to suicide. Um, he was 33 at the time. What do you do in that situation? Just don't know what to do. My partner was working and we were on tax credits, but obviously the finances completely changed when it happened. I felt bad that I didn't have the money, that I couldn't give him the send-off I would have wanted. So I couldn't, um, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, get a, a certain headstone or a certain coffin or, I just had to, we had to go for the basics. It was lucky for me that a family all pulled together and helped to pay for the funeral or I don't know what I would have done. I also set up a GoFundMe page some people don't like the GoFundMe process and they see it as begging and things like that. But for me, I think it was my way of um, trying to contribute. Funeral poverty is a long way from being lifted unless someone else is introduced. Having a decent standard of living is about so much more than just money. It's about being able to socialise and do the everyday things that most people take for granted. Christine's daughter is getting married this year. Despite the happy news as mother of the bride, this is yet another expense that she's struggling to afford. I hope the wedding goes amazing. <laughs> it, it will. OK then, thank you. Okay, bye. 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 This is the bracelet that I bought her. We went together to pick it. I wouldn't normally buy that. That was out of the fact that I'd sold the bed, that I was able to buy her uh, things to go, to go with a wedding dress.
we've had a lovely day and it's all come together good and we've all we've had fun getting ready and this is a present for me to Katie. because I think it's important. The media have made it out like it's fun and they enjoy taking the money from the state and so on, when it's not like that at all. People don't realise that when it's hidden poverty, there's so much hidden potential in that person and it gets overlooked so easily. It, you really have to fight your way back but you never forget what it's actually been like to be in these situations. It never leaves you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is the first time I've had a gathering, really, in Leeds in four years. And again, that's my own apprehensions. That's me withdrawing because is my house good enough to have people in? We've come together as friends and it's a bond. It's a nice bond that we can be comfortable and together with each other. Can we all raise a glass to being free of cancer again and happy birthday to me and Christine. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And and cheers to memories. cancer free. <laughs> happy memories. Living in poverty means living with shame and judgment. We don't think that's right. But we've found that by coming together we can help to change that. By giving people their dignity and seeing their needs before they have to ask for help. By telling our stories, we are hoping that we can break down the barriers between those in poverty and those who haven't been there. And all we want is for people in decision-making roles to listen to us and work with us. I think it's important that we're doing um, a film like this. I think it's important that people hear about the shame. Sometimes it makes you wonder if you've passed it down. If it's one of those things that you pass down, if it then becomes their issue. It's important to give people who are too afraid to tell their story a voice through other people and their stories. I think to me it's more of um living the shame, feeling it and moving on but inspiring people through that shame by awareness and making films like this. <laughs>